It's 4 o'clock on a Monday, and you know what that means. It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. In 2015, I might add. And welcome to the big show. Thank you, fake band. Thank you, fake audience. Get the chat room open so I can say hello to the real audience. There you are. Hi, guys. Uh, I hope you all had a very, very, very wonderful holiday season. Um, we did uh, at our house, uh, I think all the staff did, didn't hear any complaining, um, went out for a bowling uh, outing about a week ago with the staff for the holidays. That was pretty much fun. Uh, I think we'll have a video, an embarrassing video coming to you soon. Uh, and welcome to 2015. I can't believe that it is 2015 already. I think we've actually uh, been doing Taxi TV now for four years, maybe? I don't remember. I think the first one was 2009, 2010. Wow. It, it could be coming up on five years, I think around May, I think. Anyway, um, really glad to be here, and uh, I see all, all the regulars in there. A bunch of people I didn't think would show, because this is really... Uh, I'm calling today Taxi 101. We got a whole bunch of new members in the month of December. I think people that were um, getting serious. You know what? The new year's coming. It's like signing up for the gym, and it's my job to make sure that people actually go to the gym and use the, the equipment. So... Uh, we're going to get bombarded with a bunch of questions from new members, as we always do. And so I'm going to go through as many of these as I possibly can today. Um, I'm not going to take uh, questions during the show because it'll throw me off my pace, and we wouldn't want that to happen. You know I can get a little chatty. Okay, so topics we're going to cover today. Let's just jump right into it and go down this list. I'm going to have to speak very quickly. There are a lot of things on the list. I'm trying so hard not to look at the... Uh, um, at the chat room, but these are my people in there. The regulars are there. So question number one, we get this all the time from new members and old members alike. Do I need to copyright my music before submitting it to Taxi? I'm certainly no copyright attorney, um, but practical um, advice that I've heard over the years is that, well, I mean, it's something I know for a fact. Um, is that your song is copyrighted the minute you commit it to a medium, um, whether that's paper or recording it somehow, it's copyrighted. But if you don't register the copyright with the Library of Congress Copyright Office, then you don't actually have any proof as to the date of the copyright. So if somebody infringed your copyright and you had to defend it, you'd have a pretty hard time saying, but I wrote it in, you know, 19... 97 or 2014, whenever. Um, somebody, people inevitably ask, well, what about a poor man's copyright? Can I just mail myself a CD and leave it unopened in an envelope? Um, probably not a good idea. Again, I'm not an attorney. I can't give legal advice. Although I did meet once with um, Donald Passman, who I've known for very, very many years, and he wrote... Uh, a killer book uh, on the business side of the music industry called Everything You Need to Know About the Music Business, I believe is the title. And he's also one of the biggest music attorneys out there. And I asked him that question on behalf of our members many years ago, probably in the mid to late 90s. And his answer surprised me. He said, look, it's better than nothing, but don't rely on it. You know, um, just register your stuff with the Copyright Office, um, Library of Congress. Here's something else you should know, which is you don't have to wait until the copyright stuff comes back to you in the mail before you can submit it to Taxi or give it to other people. Just send it off. You can do it on a website at, um, was it copyright.gov, I believe, or librarycongress.gov, and then go to the copyright uh, pull-down. Um, it's, what's it up to now, guys? Like 35 bucks a song or something? But you can do a compilation. You can do the collective works of. So you can do a number of songs under one copyright as long as you don't substantially change any of the songs that are in that collection. It's much more cost effective. I will also tell you that I was shocked not that long ago to find out that some of our members who do instrumental cues, um, they're almost factory-like in the way they crank them out and they tend to do, you know, dozens if not hundreds of them in a year. 
and they're typically 60 seconds to two minute long instrumental cues and they might crank out the same cue and put it in five different non-exclusive libraries and I'll get to that in a minute. They don't even bother copywriting their stuff because they don't care if somebody rips them off because they've got so many of them out there. I don't know that I would personally follow that advice, but they do it that way. And very often they put their music in production music libraries, which are film and TV specific music publishers. And um, very often they go into non-exclusive libraries where they retitle the, the, the instrumental track or the cue, and they're going to um, register a copyright under that new title anyway. So some of our members don't copyright their stuff. I don't know that I can, I'm not going to legally endorse that or suggest that you don't copyright your stuff. Just know that there are some people that take that approach and you'd be wise to go on the taxi forum at forums.taxi.com and ask your fellow members um, what approach they take for different types of music. If you're pitching stuff to major artists on a record label, copyright it. Absolutely uh, register the copyright. Um, I think I, if I were a songwriter writing songs, I would always register my copyrights. Okay, um, what do I do if I don't see industry listings for the kind of music I make? And how do I make sure that I'm seeing all of Taxi's opportunities? Um, we don't run listings for every single genre on the planet Earth. It would be impossible to do that. And basically, the listings that we do run are largely dictated by what the industry needs. Various you know, entities within the industry, whether it's film and TV music supervisors or production music libraries um, or record labels looking for stuff for artists that they have on their rosters, um, so it's whatever is popular in the marketplace is generally mostly what they're looking for. Do they sometimes look outside of that stuff? Might they request something quirky and weird? Yes. Um, jazz is a genre that we don't see as many listings as I would like to see. Happen to like jazz. Um, and there aren't that many jazz labels out there these days, but the place that you will see jazz listings, you know, a couple times a month, a few times a month maybe, um, are film and TV situations where they could be looking for um, smooth jazz or light tinkly piano jazz that would play in the background of a restaurant scene or an upscale club or a hotel lobby or something or possibly an elevator in a TV show or a movie. So um, again, it, it kind of follows what the market is looking for. Top 40 pop, a lot of listings for that country, a lot of listings for that rock, pop rock, indie rock, folk rock, singer songwriter, um, hip hop, uh, electronic dance. Those are all pretty busy genres. And that's what most musicians do. But if you're doing like alien space acid rock, you're not going to see listings for that. And sometimes people make music that doesn't really fall neatly into a genre. They don't know what to call it. They make up a, a weird genre that you couldn't find, you know, like the name of a chart in Billboard or on Spotify or iTunes that would have that genre defined anywhere. So if your music won't fit into a playlist or a chart of a certain genre, chances are we're not going to run listings for that kind of music. And you're going to be trying to put a square peg in a round hole. All that said, I think that a lot of our members miss a lot of opportunities because they don't read the listings. We publish listings, a fully fully updated set of listings on the 1st and 15th of every month. Um, this month we did it on January 2nd, which was last Friday. Um, but almost without exception, the 1st and 15th of every month, we publish somewhere between 35 and 50 new listings, and there will be somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 existing listings that still haven't met their hit their deadlines yet. People don't read them top to bottom. And it's really tough for us when we're putting stuff under certain genres. Do we, if we have somebody looking for a jazz instrumental piece for a restaurant scene in a movie, do we put it under jazz or do we put it under, under instrumental? That's where the members miss seeing the opportunities. So I know it's a pain in the butt to kind of scroll through and look at a hundred different listings on the 1st and 15th of every month, but really, how long is it gonna take you to run through those? 
10 minutes, there are bound to be some opportunities in there that you're not seeing. And then members complain, there's nothing in my genre. Well, we'll go research it and find out, gee, you know, there were nine things in your genre last month, but you didn't look in the right place. And again, it's really hard for us. If we have a music supervisor looking for, you know, indie folk instrumentals, do we put it in indie folk? Uh, do we put it under folk? Do we put it under indie? Do we put it under in instrumental? So we look at the listing kind of holistically and we'll discuss it amongst ourselves and try and pick our best spot to put it in. Um, because it's all database driven, it's really hard to put it um, like in three places. Well, why don't you put it in indie, folk, and instrumental? Too much of an explanation to go into, but not that practical or doable from our end. Um, okay, I'm going to check these off as I do them so I know where I've been and what I've done. Um, we get calls from people every day that say, I'm not getting your emails. I just joined and I'm not getting any emails. You should typically be getting um, an email from us every day. We publish a daily alert that's got typically somewhere between three and four, maybe as many as five um reminders of listings that are going to be deadlining tomorrow. Um, people tend to forget about it. They look, they might look at the listings on the 1st and 15th, or we've got special listings that come out uh, that we publish typically a new special just about every day of the year, um, every business day of the year. Um, and those are things that come in that people need them sooner than if we ran it. Let's say we get a listing uh, in an email that comes to us on January 3rd and the music supervisor needs it on January 10th. Well, we're not going to publish our next big list until the 15th. So we can't really wait until the 15th to put that listing out there. So we run it as a special. It goes out on a one-off daily basis to you guys. Um, and there will be two or three or four reminders underneath it of stuff that is coming, hitting the deadline tomorrow or the next day. So people tend to think that, oh, those are all the taxi listings when they're really not. You need to go. Um, the best way to see all the taxi listings is go into your personal taxi hosting account. And in the right hand column, you will see them all. And you can do a control F and search for instrumental. That way, every listing with the word instrumental in it will come up. So a very practical way to search that. All right, here comes a big one. Um, how to read and interpret taxis industry listings. Uh, boy, I could do, I have done an hour show on this. I'm grabbing a prop. These are actually, I tape, I tape these all together, but these are printouts of listings that I think went out last Thursday or Friday. Uh, many of them uh, were reminders, and this is just a big, hairy, much larger than usual list. So I'm going to take a couple of these and use them as examples. Um, the members tend to see in the listing what they want to see to make the listing fit what they've got. That's a mistake. We are not a company that makes money on the submission fees. Virtually every one of our competitors that I can think of that does make money on submission fees. And one of their goals, obviously, would be to get as many submissions as they possibly can. So therefore, they put out ridiculously short, um, uninformative, no detailed listings whatsoever. But from the musician perspective, when they I saw one, I think it was late last night, Yes, I was working on a Sunday night at midnight, and I saw a listing from one of our so-called competitors, and it said something like, uh, looking for happy songs um, for a major motion picture company, $15,000 sync fees. And I thought, that listing is BS. Um, just not real. We actually busted this company once before for running a listing for a major motion picture company where we know everybody in their film music department, including the head of the film music department. And we called them up and they said, we'd never heard of this company. We did not authorize that listing. And no, we're not looking for that kind of music. We haven't had a film in production at all this year that would need that kind of music. That's total BS. So I'm assuming that the listing I saw very late last night was also BS. I can't say that for sure, but 
pretty, you know, not a stretch. And it, it literally was like a sentence or two, basically said, looking for, you know, up-tempo, happy songs of any, or actually it said like happy songs, any genre, any tempo needed for major feature film by a major motion picture studio. Come on. We all know better than that. Maybe some people don't know better than that, but when music supervisors, who are the people that look for music for film and television, need stuff, they typically need something to fit a particular mood or a particular scenario, a particular scene. They've probably already tempted in, which means they took a song, you know, an existing song that's been on the charts or something that they're familiar with, and they slugged it in because it had kind of the right texture and tempo and mood and tone, maybe even a lyric theme that all worked for that scene. And they've kept it in there as just kind of a, a placeholder for the director and the producer, who, anybody involved to know this is kind of where we're going with that. And sometimes they'll even try to license the song that they used as the temp, the placeholder. Um, other times they'll go out and look for something else like it because they know that that song would be way too much money and it would blow their entire budget on one song and they may, may need nine pieces of music for that episode. So that's when they reach out to us and they run a listing. And here's, uh, here's the listing. This I just literally the first one on this list. So it's kind of randomly selected. Female empowerment songs with female vocals are needed by an A-list Hollywood music supervisor for a non-exclusive placement in a hit TV show on a big cable network. He's not looking for old school songs like I Am Woman by Helen Reddy. He is looking for songs that are more contemporary than that. Here's a direct quote from the music supervisor. What I do need is a female empowerment song a la Bonnie Raitt, something funky, comma, bluesy, comma, or whatever else you feel might work. We're interpreting that as, he, and this I'm still reading here, this is what you would get as the member. We're interpreting that as he'd prefer something that's in that funky, bluesy lane Bonnie Raitt is in, but if we find something that's got a cool vibe and sounds somewhat current and is really strong, he'd be open to hearing it. Um, we know this TV show well, and it's not the kind of show that a typical radio-style Pop 40 hit like Kelly Clarkson's song Stronger, What Doesn't Kill You, would work for. Go for something more earthy, maybe even a little bit gritty in what you send. Your production could be a stripped-down guitar vocal, if it's really great, or a full band artist song. But again, we wouldn't recommend heading down the top 40 radio pop lane or hard rock or electro for this pitch. We also think he's looking for songs about being strong and not about being angry, like I Am Woman, Hear Me Roar. Um, or, oh gosh, what was her name? Uh, I can't think right now. Um, Alanis Morissette had some songs that were kind of angry. Uh, empowering for females, yes. Angry, also. Um, all tempos could potentially work, and lyric themes should have concepts about feeling independent, feeling strong, standing on your own, not needing a man, moving forward on your own, rising up, etc., etc., etc. Those three etc. mean, you know, don't just look at the our list. Think, project, protract that list out further. Um, I don't know where the heck did I go. Universal lyrics that don't mention specific names, dates, times, places, or brands will stand a better chance of getting used. I'm leaving Chicago equals not universal. I'm leaving town equals universal. Could we explain it any better than that? Your song should be broadcast quality. Parenthetically, great sounding home recordings are fine. Um, a great melody, awesome lyrics, a cool vocal that connects with listeners, and a special vibe that makes the hair on your arm stand up are all things that will help you nail this placement. The estimated license fee for this use is one to three grand, depending on the ultimate use. Um, this is a non-exclusive direct-to-music supervisor pitch, so you'll keep 100% of your master and publishing rights, plus you'll also get 100% of the sync fee and any applicable performance royalties. I will explain all that. On, with further bullet points. You must own or control 100% of the master and copyright to pitch for this opportunity. Please do not copy or rip off the reference artists or songs in any way, shape, or form. All songs will be screened on a yes-no basis by a person hand-picked by the music supervisor. Um, no full critiques. Please submit one to three songs uh, by 4 p.m. last Friday, January 2nd. So my goodness, let's see all the stuff. I definitely won't be reading any more listings because that one took me minutes to read. 
Um, but what do we know? Female empowerment songs, yes. Check. Female vocals, check. Needed by a music supervisor for non-exclusive placement. That means that you're still going to own your original copyright and original master. Uh, hit TV show, check. Cable network, check. So you know you know, you can approximate what you're going to get paid. I mean, you know you're not going to make as much money from this placement on the back end as you would from a primetime show on ABC. Cable networks pay less because the audiences are smaller. He's not looking for old school songs like I Am Woman by Helen Reddy. Check. We know something else. He is looking for songs that are more contemporary. We know something else. Uh, here's a direct quote from the supervisor. What I do need is a female empowerment song a la Bonnie Raitt, something funky, bluesy, and whatever else you feel might work. So we, now we know. He kind of likes Bonnie Raitt, funky and bluesy. But if you hear something else that you think might work, great. So if I were the member, I would first search my catalog, go, do I have anything that sounds like it might have been done by Bonnie Raitt? Not trying to copy her or sound just like her. Is there anything that sounds you know, that's got that smoky, bluesy, Bonnie Raitish vibe to it. That's what he's most interested in. But again, he's it's kind of rare, but he's coming at this with an open mind if we hear something else. Um, we know this TV show well. It's not the kind of show that a typical radio-style pop hit like Kelly Clarkson's Clarkson song, Stronger, What Doesn't Kill You, would work for. We need something more earthy. So we've given you, that's just, you know, the first half of the listing, we've given you so many solid, I hate to say clues, but they're clues. Um, they're pieces of the puzzle. So here's what happens is new members and a lot of old members will see one thing. Um, female empowerment song with female vocals. And they stop reading everything else that's in there. They ignore Bonnie Raitt. They ignore Funky. They ignore Bluesy. Um, they ignore Earthy, they ignore the warning, don't send pop, and we will get songs that are pure radio pop that sound just like Katy Perry or Kelly Clarkson, um, you know, somebody that's currently on the charts doing a pure, like, dance pop song that's completely not what this music supervisor is looking for, and then when our screener hears it and they return it because it's dance pop top 40, the members are ticked off. Hey, I sent you a female empowerment song with female vocals. Yes, you did, but you didn't send the right kind. So there you go. Um, so that's what you need to do. Every time you want to submit to a listing, don't get overly excited about it. Um, don't let it be an impulse buy. We don't need your five bucks so badly that we want you to make a bad pitch. We just don't want that to happen. We are not like those other companies that we just want your submission fees because we split them with the listing companies. We don't split them. They go to pay for the screeners that filter the music. And they, they want to forward your stuff. I will tell you that about the screeners. They'd much rather have a happy member than an unhappy member because happy members renew and provide work for them. So there is a predisposition amongst the taxi a &R people to forward your music. You may not always believe that, but trust me, it's true. So there's a little lesson on how to read and interpret the listings. You might even, some of the members take a highlighter and highlight the salient points. Other members will actually make like an ABCD checklist of the salient points. Do that and make sure that you're making a good submission. Then the next question is, why do taxis listings have so many specific requirements like tempo, universal lyrics, lyrics, etc.? I see listings from other companies that are much less detailed. Well, we've already talked about that. The reason they're less detailed is they want everybody and their brother who's got a happy song to submit their happy song of any tempo, any genre, because they want your 5 or $10 for the submission fee, and that's what they really care most about, I believe. So make sure you're submitting the right music by, you know what, listen to your song or your instrumental, whatever you're going to submit with somebody else in the room. Let your husband, wife, sister, brother, son, daughter, next door neighbor, maybe, you know, a total stranger that can be objective. Have them listen to the song while they're reading the listing and go, yeah, that works. That makes sense. Um, chances are, in most cases, they're going to tell you, eh, it's a bit of a stretch. But you know what? 
if you read all the listings and carefully look through them, you will find stuff that will be a better match for your music, unless you're doing Alien Space Rock. Um, okay, who are the screeners and what qualifies them to judge my music? I will tell you that never do we have interns or, you know, like kids that are right out of college um, screening your music. Every single screener that's ever worked at this company has a resume that would probably blow you away. Sometimes I'm shocked by the quality of people we get. But look, let's face it, illegal downloading melted down the industry. A lot of A&R people lost their jobs. Um, the industry keeps paying less and less to the professionals. We're paying 30 bucks an hour for them to come here and listen to your music. And every one of their resumes, they've got to... Be, I'll give you an idea. Um, for somebody to get a screening job here, they have to have been an A&R person at a real label, be it a major or an indie, with some sort of track record. Uh, they have to be somebody who's been a publisher at a major or independent publisher of some repute and have been there for a while. Um, they have to have been a music supervisor, um, a music coordinator working on TV shows or films, um, somebody who's worked at music libraries. In other words, they all have really incredibly good resumes and they are specifically picked for certain genres. So we don't put somebody who's an expert on country music uh, screening an R&B thing. We don't put somebody who is a hip hop expert screening death metal. Um, they only work generally uh, in like one, two, or three genres. We have a few exceptions, people who are remarkably good at maybe four or five different genres. Sometimes it gets tough because, you know, it could be... Let, let me give you a good example. Um, okay, uh, Bruce Willis and another actor step into an elevator. They're uh, in the middle of a gunfight in an action-adventure movie. I forget the name of the movie and they run into an elevator and they go from this, you know, machine gun stuff, just crazy intense stuff with lots of intense score under it, and the elevator door shuts and all of a sudden you hear a girl from Ipanema playing classic elevator music. And um, so, girl from Ipanema, what is it? Uh, Bossa Nova, I think, would technically be the classification that it would fall under. Um, so we may have somebody on the staff that's an expert on Latin music. However, they may not be an expert on the film and TV use of Latin music. So we have to make a determination when we read the listing. Um, are we better off picking somebody who understands how to place music in a major motion picture? Um, and, and would understand the irony of going from this wild, intense action-adventure scene to this, um, how silly is that moment where a girl from Ipanema is playing, you know, da, 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 da. never going to sing on the show again, I promise. Um, chances are we would pick the film and TV person because we're not looking for, and the supervisor is not looking for an exact replacement for girl from Ipanema. They're looking for something that would have that same juxtaposition, that same tongue-in-cheek effect of here's this, kind of cheesy um, elevator music, Muzak, if you will, being played in this, you know, coming right out of a, a, an action adventure scene. The film and TV person is going to judge it from its impact on that scene. Does it get the laugh? Whereas the Latin music expert is going to judge it based on, is this really good Latin music? But it might not get the laugh. So we would probably go with the film and TV expert for that particular listing. So... Just know that you are always, and you can, by the way, go to taxi.com, our, our homepage, and I, I'm trying to remember where it is, and I don't want to mess with my browser right now. What the heck? I'll take a chance. Um, okay, going to the taxi homepage under the About tab, which is the first tab on the menu bar on the left side, there is a pull down for A&R team. And you can see the resumes of the people who listen to your music. We guarantee that those are the people listening to your music. So just know you are always in good hands. These are, are incredible professionals. Frankly, you'd be surprised that many of them work here. Like I said, we pay them well. 
they generally uh, they work in four hour shifts. They can work less, but after four hours, I think we chance having them burn out. So we have a morning shift and an afternoon shift. They're independent contractors. They can take the shift. They can turn it down. They can book a shift and not show up. Um, they can leave early because they've got to go to the studio and work on something. But ultimately, we make sure that we've got the right people on the right listings um, and, and during the right time period to make sure that we can hit our deadlines. Okay. Um, isn't submitting my music to Taxi like playing the lottery? I wish that I had the control over buying a lottery ticket or, buy, or picking lottery numbers that you guys have um, submitting your music to Taxi. Is the lottery going to tell you um, female empowerment songs with female vocals? No. Are they going to tell you non-exclusive? No. Are they going to tell you that they need something contemporary? No. You get the idea. We give you all this information to help you hone in on making the right submission. I wish the lottery gave you that information. Wouldn't we all be thrilled if they said, well, today's pick six numbers, the first number is going to be between one and three. The second number is going to be between three and five. The third number is going to be smaller than nine, but greater than seven. We wish they gave that information, but they don't. The lottery is pure chance. With Taxi, there's something that you have absolute control over. Two things that you have absolute control over that come to mind for me. Number one is, are you pitching the right thing? You get to read the listing and you get to determine if the music you're pitching is right for what they're looking for. And the second thing that you have control over is the quality of what you're pitching. The better your music is and the better you pitch it, the better your odds are. So it's nothing like the lottery. Um, what are taxi screeners looking for and how they judge, I probably should have said, how do they judge my music? They are not looking, they are, and the next question ties into this, so I'm going to wrap those two together. Does their personal taste come into play when they decide what gets forwarded? Not really. Um, not in the sense you would think. Uh, the screeners aren't sitting there listening to a piece of music going, hmm, I really like this, because they could love the hell out of it. But if it's not right for a female empowerment song, um, you know, that, that meets all these other criteria, they can't forward it. It could be the greatest song on the planet, and they won't forward it because it doesn't meet the criteria of the listing. We're telling you what they want. Um, does personal taste come into play? I covered that. Uh, what are they looking for? They're looking for the, the same two things I was just talking about a minute ago. Um, they're looking for, is it well done? Is it well written? Is the vocal performance convincing or um, powerful or sincere and authentic and heartfelt? Whatever the situation calls for. So is the song on target or the instrumental piece on target musically for what they've asked for? Is the performance something that's really compelling in whatever form it needs to be compelling in? Um, and I lost my train of thought. Uh, oh, and is it on target stylistically? Now, it could be that the listing asks for um, up-tempo contemporary female country songs a la... Pick a female country artist. Um, oh, shoot. Uh, um, I'm drawing a blank on her name. Uh, anyway, um, so let's say that it mentions Martina McBride, okay? And uh, you send in a song that's kind of raunchy, uh, um, filled with attitude, and um, just doesn't sound anything like something that Martina McBride would typically cut because it's not part of her image, it's not part of her sound, it's not part of her vibe, it's not going to appeal to her audience, um, her fan base, okay? It's going to lose her fans. So you may send in a song that is, in fact, female country um, and contemporary female country, but if it doesn't meet the other criteria, and if we gave, let's say, Martina McBride and Faith Hill as the references, you pretty much know kind of the ballpark. Um, we're going to give you two or three or four references 
so you know the ballpark. So they're not looking, for, the screeners are not looking for what they like and what they think is, oh, I really like the song. I would listen to the song in my car. I would play this at home when I'm mopping the floor. No, they're looking for stuff that meets the criteria that the industry professional on the receiving end has asked for. And that is the beauty of Taxi is that we are, we're like personal shoppers. We help them find what they need. And we help you guys find slots that are right for your music. And the feedback you get from us helps you learn how you're doing as far as what you're pitching and what your, how well you're targeting your stuff is, uh, how well you're targeting your stuff and how good it is. You may be on target stylistically, but the song is just not great. We're going to tell you that it stylistically fit the listing. Well, why the, why the hell didn't you forward it? Because it's still only a B-plus song, and you're going to be competing against A and A-plus writers for this particular slot. Not always, but for this imaginary Martina McBride thing that I just came up with. Um, can the screener be having a bad day and my music doesn't get forwarded because of that? People will ask us, did the screener, you know, uh, no, nah, I won't go there. Uh, did the screener have a good night last night before they went to bed? Uh, maybe they didn't and they woke up with a bad attitude today. Did the screener have coffee before they came to work? Are they working on an empty stomach? Did they just get back from a trip to the dentist? I can't say that it's never, ever, ever happened in the history of the company that somebody was having a bad day and lost their focus. But you'd have to meet these people and see them. They take what they do very seriously. They know that we check up on them to make sure that they are meeting the standard that we ask of them to make our customers happy. We actually look at, at, at their critiques to make sure that they're doing their job well. Um, just as if you hired a house painter to paint your house and they just finished doing uh, the eaves. You're probably, if you're a smart homeowner, going to climb up on the ladder and look to see how they did. Did they stay within the lines? Did they, you know, get a nice even coat of paint on there? So we do that with the screeners and I can tell you, not with absolute certainty, but with a great deal of certainty, that they're more professional than that. That um, it'd be the same thing, uh, you know, if, if because a lot of our screeners are actually pro musicians. Um, I can think of one gentleman who's um, the bass player in the band The Knack. He played on My Sharona. Um, I just can't imagine him showing up for a session where he's playing bass for somebody, and if he had a bad day, um, turning in a bad performance. He's a pro. He's going to turn off that bad day when he walks in the room and starts playing bass. He may go back to it when he puts his bass back in the case and walks out to his car after the session. And the same thing would be true here. They're here to do a job and they know if they don't do it well, we won't continue to use them on future listings. If a screener is on the fence, why don't they forward my music and let the person at the record label or the music supervisor or music library or whatever the entity is that requested music, if you're on the fence, why don't you send it to them and let them decide? Because they actually want us to make that decision because they don't have the time. I know that it's easy to imagine that people in the music industry sit around with their, I was going to put my feet up on my desk, but there's no room, that they sit around listening to music all day. What a cool job that must be. Maybe they do a bong hit or have a cigarette or sip on a beer while they're doing it. It's not that at all. They spend 90% of their time taking care of music, I mean of business stuff, and probably 10% of their time listening to music. And they work crazy hours. They work under a lot of time pressure, especially in episodic TV where they've got to crank out enough music for an episode on a weekly basis. It's not like they just sit around going, ooh, I love this song. I'm going to put it in the show somewhere. They've got to find music that um, the producer is going to say, that's really good. It elevated the emotion, amplified or underscored the emotion in that scene. It fits the vibe of the show. This scene takes place in, in you know, kind of a, a dusty, gritty roadside bar, like a biker bar kind of place. They're not going to put in, you know, a, a Katy Perry song coming out of the jukebox in that scene. They're going to have some, you know, kind of 
crusty, bluesy, greasy song that you can almost smell the sweat on and feel the grease on coming out of that jukebox, because that's what bikers would listen to in a biker bar. So if the screener is on the fence, more than likely what they're going to do is tap the screener next to them and say, you know what, here's what I'm working on right now. Should I or should I not forward this? And they're going to get a second opinion. We also have somebody here who is the head screener who is in charge of all the screeners, making sure that they stay on task and on target doing what they're doing. And if they've got a question, this is somebody who screened here for several years, who we hold in very high esteem. They can walk in into his office and say, I'm on the fence. Here's what the listing says. You know the listing, the person who requested the music. Here's the song. Do you think I should forward this or not? So they're going to get a second opinion, all right? People often ask, why don't you have a panel? Why don't you have three screeners listening and let them decide? We actually tried that uh, in, I think, 1995, somewhere around there. We tried that, and we found out the result for what got forwarded and what got returned was exactly the same. But now we were paying 90 bucks an hour because we had three people listening to the same piece of music. So if we did that, we would have to triple the submission fees to $15 a song. And I don't think you guys would like that a whole bunch. Just guessing, but I think that I'm right. So we tested it, and the results were the same. Plus, you're going to get dissension among the ranks. Uh, if you've got three people, finding, getting three people, even two out of three, to agree on something, actually, you probably stand a greater chance, uh, a chance of not getting forwarded by having three people listening to your song at once. Um, what happens when your music is forwarded? How long does it take to hear back from them? It depends who the them is. Um, the rule of thumb is, um, <laughs> actually, uh, Stephen Giles, one of our members, uh, I really like this guy a lot. Uh, this is an old adage created by taxi members, and he actually put it on a bumper sticker and brought it to the road rally two years ago. Write, submit, forget, repeat. In other words, don't sit by the phone waiting for that call from the music supervisor. You like that? Use of prop. Um, don't sit there waiting for them to call you. Um, they, uh, Your song is your big priority. You're excited as hell that your song has now been forwarded to a major record label or a big producer or a big music supervisor or a publisher, a music library, what have you. And you're just so excited and you're thinking, finally, somebody in the industry is going to hear my music. And in your mind's eye, you're sitting there thinking, you see a picture of a person at a desk hanging out, listening to music and grooving on it and loving it. And then they hear your song and they go, holy crap, this is the best song I've ever heard. And they pick up the phone and call you and say, this is the best song I've ever heard. Um, doesn't really work like that. They're on projects. A music supervisor is probably working on two or three projects at the same time. They could be working on an independent film, um, a TV show, and a video game, all during the same time period. Not exactly the same start and stop points, but they're overlapping, and they've got all this stuff going on. Um, so what are they going to do? Um, they're going to listen to the stuff for that project when they're on that project. It might be two days from now. It might be a week from now. It could be a production music library that's putting together a collection of horrific music, scary music, um, that they're going to put out in probably August for people to use in TV commercials and TV shows going into post-production around, you know, for Halloween that are airing at Halloween time. So they're going to need stuff in probably uh, August, July, August, September. So they may run the listing with Taxi back in February. We may send them the stuff. We probably do send them the stuff um, February in March, maybe April. And they may get around to it in April or May and listen to it. And they may put it in the pile, um, digital pile or physical pile, depending on if it's CDs or, or MP3s. And they put it in that pile because they may be looking from two or three other sources. And they've got to wait till they collect all this stuff. And when are they going to do it? When are they going to finally listen to it? The same point in time when you would cram for finals, probably the night before they absolutely have to, because that is human nature. So even though they ran the listing in February, they don't need to put this batch of horror songs out, horrific songs, until 
um, July or August, they're going to wait until June 25th to start listening to that music. And you're going to be sitting there just dying, waiting for that call, getting discouraged. I haven't heard a peep out of them. I will tell you that many, many, many of our members have actually heard from these companies as much as a year or two later. They put something in a folder on their desktop of their computer in the I like this folder. And uh, maybe they were on an airplane and had four hours to kill. And they were cleaning off the desktop on their laptop. They saw that folder and they started listening to stuff and they went, wow, I really, really like this. And they end up reaching out to you when they get back from that trip. So you just don't know. But we have literally had deals that have happened the same day or the next day. We have had deals that have happened as far out as a couple of years later. I think we've even had a couple that have happened three years later. And what's really heartbreaking to me is members that drop out of taxi don't renew their membership because they got a bunch of stuff forwarded. They never heard from anybody. And then a year after they dropped out, they get a couple of phone calls from the companies that sign them. And the sad part is they could have kept feeding the pipeline if they had remained members. Because obviously their music was good enough that we forwarded it. Obviously it was good enough that somebody wanted to sign it, put it in a catalog, or if somebody licensed it for a TV show, movie, whatever. And they could have been feeding the beast with more stuff during that year or two that they weren't members. So they just literally like stunted their growth and stunted their future, future possibilities. It's time for a drink. My mouth is dry. What am I going to drink? Rockstar. This episode is sponsored by Rockstar. He says as he chug lugs something very, very sweet and tastes like Hawaiian punch, but with bubbles. Um, okay, what should I do if I never get forwarded? Um, what should you do if you never get forwarded? It's got to be for one of two reasons. Either you're pitching it to the wrong stuff, and the critiques will tell you that. Always look in, on our feedback form in the lower right-hand corner. The reason you weren't forwarded for this listing is. That is a direct reason why you weren't forwarded. The screener may mention that the guitar was out of tune. The screener may mention that the lyric wasn't cohesive. The screener may mention a million things because they're trying to be helpful. But the one that really matters if you want to know why you weren't forwarded will be in that box in the lower right-hand corner that says your music was not forwarded for this listing because... We hate it when people go online and say, do you believe it? They didn't forward my song because the guitar was out of tune. They're just bringing that to your attention because they want you to fix it. That's all. They're just trying to be helpful. They're not trying to be hurtful. They're not trying to piss you off and go, ha, 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 I screwed another musician. They're just trying to be helpful. So if you're not, if you never get forwarded, then there are a few things you can do. Number one, target your submissions better. Read the listings better so that you can target your submissions better. Number two, um, you probably need to look at, do you sound contemporary enough or do you sound dated? A lot of our members are middle-aged people that used to make music back in their 20s and now they've got a little time and a little money and they've put together a little home studio and they're back to it, but their music sounds like it came from the 70s or 80s. So maybe you need to sound more contemporary and work on that. The feedback sheet, the critique in the lower right-hand corner will tell you that. The other thing you can do is go on the Taxi Forum at forums with an s forums.taxi.com once again that's forums.taxi.com and you will see a section in there called peer to peer um, our forum is the friendliest most helpful forum that you will ever find um, for musicians anywhere that I think all of us who you know go on the forum would agree on that uh, we don't have trolls if we do we get rid of them um, we have experienced members who were inexperienced three years ago, four years ago, five years ago, who are very generous with their time and their knowledge in helping new members kind of um, get with the program. So you can go into the peer-to-peer -peer thing and you can post, here's the listing, and don't just post the listing number, post the full listing and say, this is the listing and here's the song I'm thinking about submitting for it. Do you guys and gals think that this is a good pitch? And they will tell you. 
and you're going to get consensus one way or the other. You're, you'll get a few dissenters, but you're going to get consensus. You're going to get somewhere between three and 30 people that are going to say, you know, the song is pretty good, Bob. However, the vocal isn't really well executed. It's certainly not in the style of Martina McBride or Faith Hill. I wouldn't make that pitch. And while you're at it, you might want to check out the tuning on the guitar. So it's like having a second set of objective ears, uh, many of whom are experienced members who've grown a lot and matured a lot in their ability to make music and, and produce better music with their home studios. And it's an incredible resource that all of our successful members seem to really love. So if you're not using the peer-to-peer -peer section on the Taxi Forum before you submit, then you're nuts. And don't worry, um, as far as I know, to the best of my knowledge, nobody has ever had a song or an idea hijacked from there. Um, frankly, I've been in the music industry now, I think, 39 or 40 years. And I think the only times I've ever seen copyrights infringed, they were always like, you know, somebody claimed Michael Jackson stole their song or Paul McCartney stole their song or Bruce Springsteen stole their, stole their song. Um, there are so few infringement cases that have any merit to them. People generally, I don't think they're that motivated to steal a song from another novice or that some pro in the industry is going to steal a song from somebody who is not yet a pro. If they're going to steal, they're going to steal from somebody who writes hits. Um, and, and you just don't see that much of it going on. That said, I can't say that it would never happen. I've just not seen it happen more than like three or four times in almost 40 years. Um, What do the comments on the feedback forms mean? I think I already talked about that. You know, they're just trying to be helpful. Always look for the lower right-hand box if you want to find out why you weren't forwarded. The follow-up question is, what do the numerical ratings on the feedback form mean? Those numbers are only there to give you a relative sense of how you're doing with your song's title, um, with your melody, with your arrangement, with your production, with your engineering, um, with your prosody, which is the melody, how do the melody and lyric work together, um, your phrasing, all that stuff. Those numbers don't determine. Nobody sits down with a computer or a calculator or an abacus or anything else and says, well, this guy got a 7.8, can't forward him for this, or this person got a 9.4, let's forward this song. It doesn't work that way. It's only, those numbers are only there to give you some relative sense of where you're at. Um, if you got a nine on lyrics and a nine on melody and a nine on prosody, but a three on production, then you might want to improve your demo production. Um, the reverse would be true, obviously, if you had like a, you know, a nine on production and your songwriting was a four, time to go to work on your songwriting. So there you go. That's what the numbers mean. Why do some listings have full critiques and others have shorter critiques? The reason is when we've got more time, all of them used to have full critiques for many, many years. And then as the industry sh started to shift, actually kind of followed our lead into film and TV, um, independent musicians being used in film and TV, we started getting more and more listings that were quicker turnaround. And when somebody runs a listing with us and they need the stuff back in their hands a week later, the only way that we can meet that timeline was to do yes, no listings where the screeners listened and went good enough and on target enough to send to them or it's not. The problem was our members were going, come on, give me something. I need to know why you didn't forward it. So we created the, what we call the short in-house, in the short form critique, which does give you a little information. Let's them give you a sentence or two. Um, and gives you a reason that it wasn't forwarded for that listing. So you're not walking away empty-handed. And frankly, again, they're liable to say something like, you know what, the vocal um, was pitchy, um, or the guitar wasn't in tune. That doesn't necessarily mean it's the reason it wasn't forwarded. They're just trying to be helpful and let you know that as well. If that lower right-hand box says the reason you weren't forwarded was that the vocal was so pitchy, I couldn't send it, then, then you know. Um, on the stuff that we do have more of a timeline on, which is about half of it, maybe even more than half, um, and it's frequently the record stuff because they're not so time crazy that they need stuff overnight. 
Um, generally speaking, there are exceptions. So for those things, um, we will be much more elaborate and give you a lot more feedback. Um, next question. Can you submit music that's recently been forwarded to for other listings, or do you have to wait until you've heard from the company it's been forwarded to? The answer is keep pitching that sucker until somebody says, I want it. And it could be that the entity that wants it is a non-exclusive company that means that you can keep pitching it to other catalogs that are also non-exclusive. And we'll talk about exclusive versus non-exclusive in a minute. Um, can you pitch the same music to more than one opportunity? Let's say that on January 2nd, last Friday, when you got your new updated set of listings for um, the first two weeks, um, <laughs> Stephen Giles, I stepped out while Michael was saying nice things about me. No, you didn't. You turned it off. You went to work. And not until somebody texted you, Giles, did you say that, uh, did you come back? Yes, I mentioned your bumper sticker and that I like you, that you're I think I said I like you. I do like you. Anyway, not in that sense, but you know what I mean. Um, he's talented and he's good and he makes me proud. Um, and he's hard working. Uh, okay, can you pitch your music to the same opportunity, more than one opportunity? Yes, if you get a new batch of listings and you see three things that you go through that whole process that I explained earlier about making sure you're really on target and you think that you've got the right song for three different pitches, which by the way, you could because so many times people are looking for stuff that is remarkably similar because it's what's happening in the marketplace now. So yes, you can submit it to all three of those and whoever raises their hand first and says, I want it, do that deal. If you get a call or an email from two people on the same day that both want it, then you can bounce back and forth and see who's got a deal that you like better. Um, okay, what's the difference between a music supervisor, a production music library, also, re also referred to as a music library or just a library, uh, a film and TV music publishing company, which is also sometimes just called a publisher, uh, a publisher, <laughs> just a regular old publisher, which is not related to film and TV necessarily, a major record label and an indie record label. Okay, this is going to be the really fast version, um, but you can always go back and watch the archive of this video if you need uh, more clarification. A music supervisor is the person who is in charge of selecting and licensing the music for TV shows, movies, commercials, video games, maybe even websites. Um, they're in charge of the, the producer or director of the project will work with them and say they'll do what's called spotting where they say I need music here, 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 and here. And I'm thinking rock there, country there, orchestral there, and jazz there. Um, then the music supervisor has to look at the context for which they're looking for the music and determine what they put a search out for. They reach out to taxi, they reach out to musicians they know, and they reach out to publishers, record labels, anybody that is a purveyor of music, and they find the music that they think is a good fit. They present it to their boss. The boss determines, yes, you're on target or you're not. Go back to the well if you're not. And once the music is picked, then they do the actual negotiation with the purveyor of the music to determine how much that person's going to get paid to license that music. Um, and there you go. That's what a music supervisor does. Uh, they do a lot more of the paperwork than they do a lot more businessy stuff than musical stuff, believe it or not. A music library, a production music library, a library, all the same thing. Those are film and TV specific music publishing companies. Um, and back in the old days, they were known for cranking out canned music. Um, it all sounded very homogenized. Um, it was probably played by the same musicians in the same studio with different people writing the charts. Nowadays, and Taxi really pioneered this, if I can pat myself on the back for that one, most libraries are filled up with a bunch of music from independent musicians just like you guys, whether it's instrumental stuff, um, or whether it's songs. So there you go. Uh, music libraries are film and TV specific music publishers. Um, the same thing as a film and TV music publishing company. They specialize in music for film, TV, commercials, video games, what have you. A regular publisher, just called a publisher, um, 
back in the day, a publisher would sign songwriters, like back in the days of the Brill Building. A publisher, like maybe Warner Chapel, um, would sign a stable of publishers. They would give them an advance against future royalties. They would obligate them to write X number of songs per year that they would then license out to artists, typically on major record labels, for those artists to cut. They would hope that the artist would cut one of their songs, have a giant hit, and the publisher would get um, usually 50% of the publisher's share. Every dollar generated by music publishing um, has what's called a publisher's share and a writer's share. In a perfect world, and still pretty much to this day, but there are exceptions, the writer's share is sacrosanct and always stays with the writer. So let me pull out a prop. I'm not going to rip this dollar bill in half because if I did, I think I'd be breaking a law. But let's say you've got a dollar. There's the publisher's share. That's 100% of the publisher's share. There's 100% of the writer's share. Now, when a publisher does a co-publishing deal with you, that means that you, the writer, keep 100% of the writer's share, and the publisher's share is then split pretty typically, but not always, but pretty typically, the publisher's share is split between you and the publisher. Therefore, you get 100% of half of it and half of the other half, so you have essentially netted out at 75% of the income that the publishing from that song is going to generate. The publisher gets 25%, even though they're getting 50% of the publisher's share. All right, got that? Go by um, Music, Money, and Success. Music, Money, and Success by Todd and Jeff Brabeck. Also by Everything You Want to Know About the Music Industry by Donald Passman. Those books explain it in much more detail than I just did using my dollar prop. Um, so publishers essentially advance you money against future royalties when your songs are licensed. And if your songs don't get licensed or you don't have hits, then they drop you from the roster and your deal is done. Anything that you created during the term of your agreement, they still have that piece of. So that's a regular publisher. A major record label. Record labels are in charge of signing artists, essentially what they're doing is they are licensing, they are licensing the right to use your music, your performance. Um, if you don't write your own stuff, and you, let's say Stephen Giles, I'm an artist, I get signed by a major record label. Stephen Giles writes a hit song, I cut the song, I license the song from him. I get a license, not like a driver's license, but I license the ability to use that song on my record. Um, the record company um, has an agreement with me to license my image and my performance of that song. Um, they advance money to go make that record and cover all the expenses involved with making the record. In exchange for that, they get a certain percentage of the gross retail sales. Back in the day when records were records or CDs or vinyl or what have you and people sold you know, 10 million copies of something, let's make the math easy. Let's say you sold 10 million copies of a vinyl record at $10 a pop. That's what $100 million generated. The record company would get 85% of that and they would justify that by saying we've got a staff of 200 people. We have the A&R staff, we have the record, the retail promotion staff, we have the radio promotion staff that gets your stuff played on radio, which generates sales. We have marketing experts, we have an art department, uh, we have a legal department, we have um, assistants, we have all these people working under our roof. That's why we get 85% of the money and you, the artist, you get 15% of the money because we bore all the risk and we fronted you some money against future royalties for doing that. That's what a major record label does. Um, an indie record label does pretty much the same thing, but it's not unusual for an indie record label to be a one person or two person, maybe five, 10 or 15 person operation, gonna be much smaller than Sony or Universal, um, the majors. Um, 
Think of them like a farm team in baseball. They tend to take more chances, sign acts that may not be ready for the major leagues yet, but they hear talent and they don't front them, you know, a hundred thousand or a quarter of a million or a million dollars. They may just say, you've got a finished CD that you made. We like it. We would like to license that CD. We will reproduce that CD. We will put it on iTunes. We will sell it in stores, blah, 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 blah. And for that, we get a percentage of the income. Those deals are all over the place as far as how the percentages break out depending on did they advance you any money to make that CD? Did you do it all on your own? If you're an independent artist and you've already sold 5,000 units of your CD, you're going to get a better deal than somebody who didn't produce their own CD and didn't sell 5,000 units. So there are many, many variables at play. So there you go. That's the quick explanation um, of what... Uh, Music Soup, music library, film and TV, music publishing company, a regular straight-up publisher, major record label, and indie label, what they do. Holy smokes, I've been talking for an hour and 15 minutes. Time for another swig of Rockstar. I knew this was a lot of questions. Um... Okay, I've already explained what a typical publishing deal is versus a film and TV deal. You know, one thing I will tell you, is we get people that live in the hinterlands, maybe Ohio. There aren't a lot of music attorneys in Cincinnati, Ohio, let's say, or Peoria, Illinois, or Ishpeming, Michigan. So Joe Taxi member gets an offer from a production music library for film and TV music. And typically the deals are just about a 50-50 deal. If I make a buck, if I'm the publisher library owner, I make a dollar, you, Stephen Giles, the songwriter, artist, makes a buck. We both make a buck. Um, it's a 50-50 split, and, and there are all kinds of deals. They range all over the place. That's a whole episode unto itself, and we're going to do one of those with a music attorney who also owns a library who's very, very good at teaching this stuff, and that's coming up very soon. Um, so for today's oversimplified version, I make a buck, you make a buck, and now... Um, Joe Musician in Ishpeming, Michigan, calls up his college roommate who is a real estate attorney who took a music law course while in law school as an elective or something and um, says, what do you think? And they look at this contract and go, holy crap, I would never give somebody 50%. That's a ripoff. No, it's not a ripoff. It's absolutely normal. It is probably, um, you know, kind of the basic starting point, average normal deal for most, not all, but most or many of the deals that happen in film and TV music. And you know what? Unless you've got a song that you're pretty sure that you can license to Katy Perry, um, and if it's going to end up in a TV show or movie, um, then why not do that deal? Um, some libraries will, you know, buy the copyright from you. So we run listings for libraries that will buy their interest in the copyright where they own 100% of the publishing and they'll pay you 100 bucks for that or 250 or maybe even 500 bucks for that. Um, and, and then they own the copyright. Other company and they own an exclusive interest in the copyright. Other companies will give you nothing up front and they still want the exclusive interest in the copyright. I probably wouldn't be all that inclined to do that deal unless the company was a company that had a great track record and was a company that I know very frequently ends up getting placements where they get a thousand, two thousand, three thousand, four thousand dollars sync fees up front, and my deal says that I get half of that. Am I willing to give my song to an awesome company for no front money if I think they're going to do pretty darn well for me in the sync fee department? Probably. Um, and you got to know that Taxi runs listings for companies that are the good guys. We vet the companies that we run listings for. Other companies that do what we do will run listings for any anybody. Let's just leave it at that. I'm not going to say anything more about that. Um, okay, well, so what's the difference between an exclusive or a non-exclusive deal? This is a, a hot button issue. I, again, I think I've done a whole show on this and we'll certainly bring it up when I've got the music attorney slash library owner on the show. Basically, the ex an exclusive deal means you put something in their catalog and they are the only ones that have a right to represent that song. 
a non-exclusive deal actually lets you take the same song. Um, I always use this example. Um, Mary loves me. I write a song called I, mean, I write a song called I love Mary, and I give it to Library A in a non-exclusive deal. They will then register a new copyright, retitle the song, and call the song um, Mary loves me instead of I love Mary. And then I give it to Library B, which is also non-exclusive because I have the right to do that. And Library B also retitles the song that says Mary and Michael love each other. And they copyright that version of it. And then Library C, we repeat the same process in Library D. Now you've got four companies out there plugging your music. And you're thinking, that's a pretty darn good deal. I've got four people working for me instead of just one. That is great, uh, but there are problems. Sometimes it can be to your advantage, other times it can be to your disadvantage. There's some music supervisors that won't mu use music or TV networks or film companies, some that won't use anything that comes from a non-exclusive library because they don't want to have any conflicts. Gee, did I get, you know, I love Mary or Mary loves me or Michael and Mary love each other from library A, B or C or D. Oh my gosh, it's mind-blowing. I don't know who to pay. I'm going to get sued by one or the other. I'm certainly going to piss somebody off. Therefore, I'm just not going to use any music from those non-exclusive companies. It was a big hot-button issue a couple of years ago. It's maybe less of a hot-button issue now. There are times and places to do exclusive deals, and I believe there are times and places... Excuse me. That was a rock star burp. Uh, times and places that you might want to do a non-exclusive deal. Like I said, we will talk about that at length coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, what is it? You see listings from Taxi pretty frequently. Um, what is a direct-to-supervisor deal, and how is that different from getting a placement through a music library or film TV publisher? A direct-to-supervisor deal means that the music supervisor working on a big TV show or movie, maybe a little TV show, whatever, that they called us directly and said, can you find me X, Y, or Z? Just like they would call a publisher or a music library, they also call Taxi. Sometimes they only call Taxi. Um, we love when that happens. Um, in those cases, because the music is not going from Taxi to a publishing entity or a music library, any form of publishing entity, and it's going direct to the music supervisor, you still keep... 100% of the publishing, 100% of the copyright and publishing, same thing. You still keep 100% um, of the master rights, meaning the, the master recording, and you're licensing it to them for the use on that episode of that show. So you, let's say it's got a $3,000 sync fee. You don't have to split that sync fee with a publisher. You keep the whole three grand and you keep total ownership of your master recording and of the copyright. Yay, you. We love those listings. We love it when supervisors do that. Um, we just had one the other day. You never know until the show comes out, but we had one the other day where a music supervisor ran one of those listings with us, got something directly from us, and loved it enough that they're playing it for the producer of the show, and hopefully it'll get placed, and the artist writer will get 100% of the money, plus keep 100% of the master and the copyright. So that's what a direct-to-supervisor deal is. They are the sweetest deals of all. What do you do if you don't understand what a listing says? If you read a listing and go, hmm, I don't really understand that. First thing I would do would be to go on the forum, and there's a section called listings, or you could go to general hangout. And I would say, here's the listing, and then highlight the verbiage that you don't understand, Chances are one of your fellow taxi members who, as I said before, very generous, is going to explain it to you. You're probably going to get two or three people chiming in, and you're going to go, ah, now I get it. If that doesn't work, um, and you could do this first. Call 818-222-2464. That number again is 818-222-2464. That is taxi's customer service number. Um, we have an extremely well-qualified staff of people who will be able to answer that question for you. And if by some chance the person who answers the phone is not adept at um, interpreting a listing, they will hand you off to the head screener um, or somebody else who is adept at doing it, and you will get an answer from them. What do you do if you need clarification on the feedback you get from us? Um, same thing. I would actually go online and ask your fellow members, um, I, uh, yes, those are 
and S tens behind me, whoever asked that question. Um, what if you get feedback and you don't understand it? That's why we've got member services at taxi.com. We also have head screener at taxi.com. Doesn't mean that every single time you get feedback that you should call up with a question about every little nuance of the critique. Please don't do that and drive us nuts, but we are a really helpful company. We do have a staff of wonderful human beings and we will try and help you, but some people abuse that relationship. And literally we have people that will reach out to us at 9.05 in the morning and spend half an hour on the phone with one staff person and then at 9.45, call back and get another staff person on the phone and ask the same series of questions and keep them on the phone for a half an hour. And then at noon, call back and get a third staff person and then repeat the whole process in the afternoon and then repeat the whole process three days later with yet another critique about another song. And they abuse the staff and not the privilege. Look, we owe you as our customers. We owe you great customer service. But if you're taking your car to the shop, three times a day for the same problem and then taking it back in three days later and then over and over. At some point, you're costing the company more than you paid for your membership. And we're probably going to call you up and very politely ask if you'd like a refund. So use all the resources we have. In the forum, I'm telling you, is a great place to get feedback. If you've got a question about a listing or um, feedback that you get from us, go on the forum and ask your fellow members because there will be more experienced members that can fill you in. Um, why do I sometimes get different feedback on the same song from different screeners? Well, chances are it was for two different listings, right? So let's say you have two listings. One of them is for a Bonnie Raitt style bluesy female vocal song for an artist on a record label. And the other listing is the aforementioned um, female empowerment songs, female vocal, non-exclusive placement in a hit TV show. That was direct to the supervisor, by the way. Um, you know, and they reference Bonnie Raitt. Well, the screeners are looking at that same song on different days. Could be the same day, but probably on different days. Different screeners, one of them is a film and TV expert looking for something that fits what that person needs for a TV show, while the other person is looking at it through the artist record label lens. If I were the producer, the label, or the artist on this record, would that song be right for me? So they're going to be looking at it from a different perspective with different glasses on and probably give you different feedback. Um, I will also tell you that if any one of you in the chat room or anybody watching this show right now, if we were to go to the Louvre Museum, I use this example all the time, and we both looked at the Mona Lisa at the same time and I said, great, whip out your legal pad and let's take two minutes each and write down our feelings, what we like and what we don't like about the Mona Lisa. Um, I may like her skin tone. You may like her smile. I may like the shading um, of the shadow. You or you know, shading of her face. You may like the shadow in the background. Um, you're never going to get the same opinion from two people. Ultimately, what you need to care about is, was the screener right in forwarding my music? And they are all professional enough that they get that right far more often than they get it wrong. And we've actually got methodologies in place to keep track and make sure if we get a lot of complaints about a particular screener, we sit down and talk with them and say, look, we're hearing, you know, this problem comes up from a lot of members. So it's not like you guys are going unheard. Now, we also get this question. Why do I get different feedback on the same song from the same screener? That one, people go, aha, busted your taxi. I submitted the same song for two different listings, and I got different feedback from the screener on two different occasions. Oh my gosh, why is that? Because you guys are trying to rip me off? No, it's because, first of all, if I got the same feedback in the same song in two different occasions, I would be pretty convinced that somebody was cutting and pasting stuff and just filling in the blanks. We don't allow that. That gets you terminated instantly as a screener here, by the way. Um, they could be looking at it through two different lenses, or 
there's a pretty good chance. It's, sometimes I'm surprised by how good the screeners' memories are. And they'll go, oh yeah, I remember that song. They don't want to give the exact same feedback because the first time they may have told you that they really liked the vocal texture and the sincerity in the song. The second time they may tell you that um, they didn't really like the drum pattern. It wasn't that contemporary or modern sounding. Why are they giving you those two different tidbits of information? Um, because they want to give you more e each time. They want to give you something different than they gave you the last time to help you grow. And members tell us all the time, you know, I've been submitting this song three, four, five, six times. I've been incorporating, I've looked for the common threads. I've been incorporating the information that I get from the screeners. And lo and behold, now that song is getting forwarded. Thank you, taxi screeners. We actually have those emails from members um, posted all over in the kitchen here at the taxi office, on the refrigerator, on the um, bulletin board in the kitchen. We want the screeners to know that the work they're doing, we, they like to get positive feedback from you guys. We like to give it to them and it helps them get more enthused about what they're doing for you because they actually work for you. Uh, my submission was forwarded for one listing and not for another. Well, uh, again, context. One listing could have been asking for Bonnie Raitt style songs for an artist on a label. Um, another listing was virtually identical to the Untrained Eye in that it asked for Bonnie Raitt style songs for a, an episode of a TV show, except the Bonnie Raitt style song mentioned something about Nashville in it. That's okay for the record. Not okay for the TV show. Why? Because the lyric is not universal. If the lyric mentions Nashville and the scene in the movie is taking play in a place in Alaska, the word Nashville will take that song out of contention for that spot. So even though it's been forwarded for one thing, it's not going to get forwarded for the other thing. And you might say, gosh, you guys are being nitpicky. Trust me, the music supervisor will be at least that nitpicky. Um... What should you do if you can't decide if you should pitch a certain song for a particular listing or not? I think I talked about this already. Go on the forums. Go to the peer-to-peer -peer section of the Taxi Forum. Um, forums with an S. Dot taxi dot com and take the listing and the uh, and a link to the song. Put them up there and ask your fellow members. Do you guys think that this is a good pitch or not a good pitch? And they will let you know. Um, what does it mean when I see in a listing, whoa, I have more questions on the next page. What does it mean when I see don't submit stiff or MIDI driven music in a listing? Um, you could be the greatest composer in the world, but if your stuff is so quantized that it sounds very robotic and it doesn't sound human, chances are, unless you're doing some sort of, you know, electro synth driven thing that could sound robotic and very quantized, it takes the humanity out of it. It doesn't sound human, and people aren't going to like it. Um, another thing that screeners will um, not forward you for is using really crappy-sounding samples. We get stuff where, like, wow, this guy's a pretty good writer. This, this lady is a very good composer. But uh, her string samples sound like the, the stock strings, in a, you know, like a, a DX7 from 1985. No, you, you've got to at least be competitive enough that you've got a reasonably good current contemporary sounding library with great synth sounds or great drum sounds or great string sounds. Do you need to go out and buy the $1,000 package? No. Could you buy the $200 package and learn how to use it really, really well? Yes. How do you learn how to use the $200 uh, set of strings really well? By going to the Road Rally, um, our convention that we host for free every year for every taxi member and a guest, um, and we will have classes on that stuff. How else can you learn? Go on the forum and ask your fellow members, do these strings sound real? How else can you learn? Watch Taxi TV. Um, all those things add up to success, and all of our successful members will tell you that they almost all use the forum on a regular basis. They almost all go to the Taxi Road Rally. They almost all listen to the feedback from the screeners and find the common threads and utilize those. And I think I'm missing one other thing. Taxi TV. Oh, and watch Taxi TV. I think I can't remember if I mentioned that or not. Anyway, okay, what does broadcast quality mean? Very big subject. We've done whole shows about that. The short version of it is that it means that the music 
is appropriately well recorded, produced, and performed for the type of thing it is. Um, if it's a big, bombastic, orchestral, action-adventure, epic piece of scored orchestral rock hybrid stuff for movie trailers, it damn well better sound really convincing and sound like a real orchestra because you are a master of your samples and know how to make orchestral stuff that sounds really, really good. The flip side of that is you could also have something that sounds um, broadcast quality. If they're looking for a Tom Waits type of, you know, gravelly, I drank too much whiskey, smoked a lot of cigarettes, and I'm mumbling a tad, um, acoustic guitar vocal for a down and out scene in a movie of some guy walking along a railroad track, uh, thinking about um, letting the train hit me. And you need a really, you know, basic acoustic guitar, vocal, um, singer-songwriter kind of song or folky song. Um, the guitar on that might be slightly out of tune. The strings might sound like they've got a little rust on them. The vocalist may be kind of pitchy, but you put it all together in the context of what it's for and the placement that it's going to be used for, the context of the scene and the type of music it is, and broadcast quality for that is dramatically different than what you would find for a Katy Perry slick radio pop hit or a big orchestral thing where the strings and the samples have to sound amazing. Again, go to the Taxi website and just do a search on the site for the words broadcast quality. We've got um, some articles written, some videos up there that will explain the stuff. You can also go on the Taxi forum and ask your fellow members, in the context of this listing, do you think this is broadcast quality or not? How do I, whoops, what does it mean when I see universal lyrics mentioned in the listings? A universal lyric, as I explained before, if it's got the word Nashville in it, it's not universal. If it talks about you and I kissed standing at the front door of my house in Tennessee on Tuesday night, not a universal lyric. Too many specifics. If it uses profanity, it's probably not going to be universal. If it talks about I used Brillo to clean my Thermidor range, not specific. If it talks about the kitchen is a mess, might be universal, but probably not, because it's talking about a specific place. Um, if it talks about how you feel, I feel great. The weather is amazing. Um, I'm trying to think of other good examples, but general things that explain stuff without using specifics generally make it universal. When I'm with her, I feel like a million dollars. That's universal. When I'm with Janie, I feel like a million bucks. Not universal. Again, you can find this information on our website. Look at in the archive of previous episodes of Taxi TV. Go into our Ustream um, and search uh, for universal lyrics. You'll probably find an entire show um, with examples in there. Also, um, Yes, I am the publisher of this book, and I make a few bucks if you buy it, but there is nothing better in the world, on the planet, um, Shortcuts to Songwriting for Film and TV by Robin Frederick, talks about universal lyrics, and is the only book in the world that it talks about songs as they relate to film and TV versus songs that you would pitch to an artist or songs that you would cut on your own record. This is the shiz for that. Song write, Shortcuts to Songwriting for Film and TV. Buy it. If you don't think it's wonderful, send it back to me in resellable condition and I will refund your money and let's see if I'm that offer from other publishers. Um, how do I get paid if my music is used? Like I mentioned before, sometimes you'll get a sync fee. Those are less and less frequently seen. Um, bigger TV shows, bigger films will pay sync fees. Smaller films and reality shows will not pay sync fees. But you do get paid what is called a performance royalty most of the time. Um, a performance royalty is the money generated um, that is collected when your song is performed. Could be performed at a concert, more than likely performed on a TV show or played on a radio station or in a movie that makes it to television because in America we don't pay a performance royalty for stuff in theatrical release 
although they do in virtually every other country around the world. Again, if you read uh, Music, Money, and Success by Todd and Jeff Brabeck, B-R-A-E-B-E-C, I believe, um, they explain it pretty well, um, very well. Um, performance royalties are paid by ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC in the United States. Um, APRA in Australia, SISEM in France, those are performing rights organizations or societies. They get the money when your sh song airs on an episode of, uh, you know, a weekly episodic thing on ABC. ABC pays a huge annual lump sum of money to um, ASCAP and BMI, and then ASCAP or BMI, depending on which one you're with, they find out from the cue sheet that is filed by the music supervisor or the music coordinator or the music editor working on that TV show, your name, your song title goes on that cue sheet, and the income stream for that gets tracked, and you typically get paid six months later after the show has aired. So you could get no money up front and get your... 47 second long piece of instrumental music used on an MTV reality show that's going to end up playing in 51 countries around the world and play three times a week um, in each of those countries. You know, sometimes you might only get 24 cents because your song played on a show, but 24 cents times three times a week times 51 countries for some period of time combined with a hundred other placements that you get it all adds up. We have members, a couple that I can think of that you older or more, you know, longtime members know that are making six figure incomes. We may have a lot more than that, actually, um, making six figure incomes and they hardly ever, if ever, get a sync fee. It's all from the performance royalty income that they get from largely instrumental music um, performed on reality shows. Okay. Um, I already explained what a sync fee is. Um, why don't all opportunities for film and TV pay, pay sync fees? Because there's always somebody standing in line behind you, the guy who wants the sync fee, that is willing to raise their hand and say, I'll do it for no sync fee. So we, the musician community, have actually driven the prices down because technology has made it so or such that everybody can crank out music that was in their heart and in their head, and now they put it on a laptop, and they can be pretty darn talented and crank out great music. So there's a glut of really, really good music out there. And where there's somebody that wants to be paid up front, there's usually somebody standing behind them that's willing to not be paid up front and get a sync fee because they just want to break into the industry. And that's why some things pay sync fees and other things don't. That's also why sync fees have dropped over the years. But like I said, even with no sync fees, some people who have a lot of instrumental cues in a lot of libraries um, and never get a sync fee are earning six-figure incomes. So there's something to be said for that. Um, I already explained what a performance royalty is. You need a PRO, a performing rights organization, to collect that performance income for you. If you're in America, you want to be with ASCAP, BMI, or CSAC. Those are the three. I think in every other country in the world, there is only one. They are um, not oligarchy. <laughs> uh, what do you call them um, when there's only one? Uh, you know what I mean. Can't think straight. I've been talking for an hour and 40 minutes straight. Um, what is a custom critique? A custom critique is something that we offer. We don't talk about it nearly as much as we should, but we have so many talented people that are screening music here at Taxi. Sometimes you just want to send in a song in guitar vocal form. Before you go to the trouble of recording it and fully producing it, just send in a guitar vocal or a piano vocal and say, can you please tell me if this song is working as it is? And they'll let you know. Does the lyric make sense? Is the song cohesive? Does it need a bridge? Um, is the chorus hooky enough? What could I do to make the chorus bigger? Um, they will answer those specific question, questions for you if you ask them. People that get custom critiques rave about them, and at 20 bucks a pop, we're typically losing a little money on that deal, but we think that it helps you guys 
make better music, which allows you to make better pitches, which gets you more deals, which causes you to go online and say, I love Taxi because, and that helps keep this company alive and kicking. So there you go. It's self-serving, but in a good way. Okay, um, that's it. If we've got any time left at, today, at the end of today's episode, we'll also take questions from viewers in the chat room. I'm going to do like three minutes of questions. My throat is raw, um, but I, I hope this was helpful. I think I'm going to make this available to all new members when they join because I think I got a lot of information into 90-some minutes there, or whatever that was, 105 minutes. Um uh, Russell Landwehr says, Michael, it really freaks me out every time you talk about listing parties complaining that people don't return their emails. Maybe I'm not getting their emails. Ack. Um, you know, Russell, I, I think you're probably getting their emails. Uh, look, when I ask the people, I will sometimes pick up the phone and call a member and say, so-and-so from such-and-such -such library just called and told me that they've emailed you. They've been trying to reach out to you because they absolutely love this piece of music and they want to license it, um, and you're not getting back to them. The member typically says, I was afraid to. So really, you've waited your entire life for somebody to actually want your music and to try and make you money with your music. And now that they're reaching out to you, you're petrified. Why are you petrified? Because musicians love to talk about how the man, the man, the industry, are, they're all bad people and they just want to screw you. Actually, they don't. They want to make a buck when you make a buck. And they can only make a buck when they've got great music. So there you go. Don't be afraid of them. Um, Adriana says, great job getting through a lot of questions. Thank you for mentioning that. Um, <laughs> Jim Carvalho says, you've done enough, Michael. <laughs> uh, what is the behind the scenes scoop on the screeners being handpicked by, oh, that's a great question, Russell. What's the behind the scenes scoop on screeners being handpicked by the listing party? Um, I'm trying to think of some great examples. I want to give actual examples. Um, we've got screeners who, all of our screeners, know people in the industry. Sometimes they're best friends with a music supervisor. Sometimes um, it could be somebody who has worked with that music supervisor on other projects. They've got the music supervisor's ear. They know what the music supervisor leans toward taste-wise. So they will actually end up screening for that supervisor. There are occasions where the supervisor or the music coordinator from the actual show will screen their own stuff. Um, so you're getting heard by the actual person. It doesn't happen all that often, but it happens. But it does happen fairly frequently that they've handpicked. They, they might go, oh, make sure that so-and-so screens this stuff. They, act, they know what kind of Americana I like. So that's what it means. It's, it's what, it, you know, what it is on its face. It, it's, they literally will say, I would like that screener who I know to screen for me. And it's usually because the screener knows them well and knows what kind of music they like um, or what they use on that show or, or films, more importantly. Um, Would you be interested in paying, us paying a little extra money to let someone in a taxi tell us how our songs would be a better fit in certain genres or direction or just use the forum? Uh, and then Matt Mayfield said they do that with custom critique. It's true, although we are somewhat reticent to say, um, if I were you, I would pitch this for country listings. Um, or if I were you, I would pitch this for Americana because sure as I'm sitting here, you're going to then pitch the next listing that says country, but you're probably going to ignore many of the other variables in that listing. And then you're going to come back and it's going to bite us on the butt when you say, but your custom critique screener said that I would pitch this for country listings. Well, yeah, but country listings where you read the whole listing and actually line up all the ducks in a row. Um, Princess Della, I can't pronounce that, says, hi, it's first time listening. Um, great, thank you. You're welcome. I love doing these. We love educating you guys because so many of our members, especially this year at the Road Rally, I asked at one point when we had a full ballroom, how many people, I think the ballroom seats like 
I want to say 1,100, 1,000 people. How many of you guys listened to or watched Taxi TV? And I would say something like 75% of the hands went up. This show has done so much to educate our members. Um, I could probably charge 300 bucks a year just for the information we give out on this show. Certainly could charge 300 bucks for a road rally ticket. Um, uh, forgive me if you answered this, but can you follow up with the screener when you get a return? Follow up by email. You can't find out which screener reviewed your submissions, right? Well, we only give out numbers because we've actually had people threaten to come here with a baseball bat and take out a screener or two. Um, so that's why we protect them from, you know, getting, I mean, you can find anybody online right now. Um, and we don't want anybody getting hurt because somebody goes nuts. Um, and no, you can't follow up the screener. And the reason is because we're not financially structured to do that. Um, if you did follow up with the screener, let's say we get in, you know, 228 submissions for a listing. And let's say that, you know, 16 of those people got forwarded. That leaves, what, 200 and whatever it is, 12 people that didn't get forwarded. What if 212 people each wanted to send an email to the screener? And you had, to, as a screener, you had to answer 212 emails at just five minutes each. Where is the calculator? So 212 emails, and these are pretty realistic numbers. 212 emails times five minutes each is 1,060 minutes divided by 60 minutes in an hour. That would be 17.67 hours just to answer the emails on one listing that one screener screened. Um, at $30 an hour, that would cost the company $529.99 to just answer those emails. That's why we can't do it. Sorry, I wish we could. Um, what is Tix Taxi Dispatch? And then I gotta go after this because it's 549 and I gotta do stuff before I leave here at six. But what is Taxi Dispatch? We don't recommend that new members join Taxi Dispatch. Taxi Dispatch was originally created probably 10 or 12 years ago um, when we started getting a lot of super quick fast turnaround listings um, from music libraries that, let's say a, a supervisor reached out to a library and said, I need um, acoustic guitar vocal love songs, or I need um, orchestral instrumentals, whatever they needed. And the library didn't feel that they had enough good stuff or any good stuff to get it to that supervisor in the next 48 hours. They would run an overnight listing with taxi and we called that taxi dispatch. We had to hire a person just to babysit that aspect of the business. It was like running a company within the company. Um, they had to deal with the intake of the listing. They had to deal with writing up the listing. They had to deal with making sure the music got screened. They had to deal with getting the music back to that person. Could have been a music supervisor that needed to get the music that quickly. Um, over the years, we have started getting more and more things that aren't quite 24 to 48 hour turnarounds. And we found out that the members who belong to Taxi Dispatch, and it costs like 43 cents a day to belong, and we prorate it. So if you've got six months left in your membership, you're paying, you know, uh, 182 and a half days times 43 cents a day. It's a pretty cheap thrill. <coughs> Sorry, getting a raw throat. Um, it's not for new members. Wait until you really learn how taxi works. Wait until you're in the saddle and wait till you start to get some forwards. Then you might want to consider taxi dispatch, especially if you do instrumental stuff for libraries and music supervisors for film and TV, because the, most of the taxi dispatch listings um, are for that type of music. Frankly, I think we've only got like 500, 600 members that belong to Dispatch. And I will tell you that the rate of deals that happens through Dispatch is quite a bit higher. And it, I think it's because only our, more, our most serious members who have the most experience and really understand how the industry works, how taxi benefits them, and how to best use taxi to benefit them will join um, Taxi Dispatch. Therefore, they get more forwards. Therefore, they get more deals. Um, all right, you guys, thank you very, very much for watching this. I hope I didn't speak too quickly, but I hope that I got a lot of great information out to you guys. Um, I will see you next week for another episode of Taxi TV. Until then, thank you for watching. Bye, you guys.